let us gavel in and begin. At, uh, as this hearing is vir uh, fully virtual, we have to address a few housekeeping matters. For today's meeting, the chair or staff designated by the chair may mute participants' microphones when they're not under recognition for the purposes of eliminating inadvertent background noise. Members are responsible for muting and unmuting themselves. If I notice that you have not unmuted yourself, I may ask you if you would like the staff to unmute you. If you indicate approval by nodding, staff will then unmute your microphone. I remind all members and witnesses that the five minute clock still applies. If there is a technology issue, we will move to the next member until the issue is resolved and you will re retain the balance of your time. You will notice a clock on your screen that will show how much time is remaining. At one minute remaining, the clock will turn to yellow. At 30 seconds remaining, I will gently tap the gavel to remind members that their time is almost expired. When your time has expired, the clock will turn red and I will begin to recognize the next member. In terms of the speaking order, we will begin with the chair and ranking member, then members present at the time the hearing is called to order will be recognized in order of seniority. And finally, members not present at the time the hearing is called to order. Finally, house rules remind, uh, require me to remind you that we have set up an email address to which members can send anything they wish to submit in writing at any of our hearings or markups. That email address has been provided in advance to your staff. The subcommittee will come to order. Good morning. We meet today to explore a crisis of grave concern to this subcommittee and the American people, the rise of domestic terrorism and extremist violence in this country, the threat it poses to public safety, free speech, the rule of law, uh, and our core democratic principles. We also will discuss how the Department of Justice and the FBI are addressing this crisis. The January 6th riot and the insur insurrection perpetrators are not sadly part of an insignificant minority, whether actors have been lone wolves or conspiring and acting in groups. This is a growing and metastasizing blight on our society. We as members of Congress all personally experience the January 6th insurrection, we, and we owe it not only to the people of our nation, but to the democratic institutions in which we serve to ensure such an event never happens again. The attack on the Capitol took domestic terrorism to a level that must not be downplayed, as FBI Director Ray testified to the Senate Judiciary Committee in March. Quote, January 6th was not an isolated event the problem of domestic terrorism has been metastasizing across the country for a long time now, and it's not going to go away anytime soon, unquote. Um, we've used the word metastasizing twice now, and that's not an accident. This is a cancer on our country. All the evidence of the past two years documented in the comprehensive database of terrorist incidents maintained by the Center for Strategic and International Studies shows that right-wing extremist attacks and plots have greatly outnumbered those from all other groups combined and caused more deaths as well. Since 2015, white supremacists, extremist militia supporters, and like-minded individuals involved in 267 plots or attacks and 91 fatalities, while incidents alleged to be from all other groups accounted for 66 incidents leading to 19 deaths, deaths including only 5% uh, associated with Salafi jihadists, the lowest share since 2008. And the CSIS data show that the January 6th breach was just one of 11 far-right terrorism attacks in January the most for any January on record. Now, despite all this evidence, we have to deal with uh, uninformed 
public commentary and even intentionally inflammatory words from leaders who seek to deflect outrage or to resort to whataboutism tactics to seek to minimize news about this crisis. Some infamously, after domestic terrorism incidents, use terms such as find people on both sides. And our law enforcement agencies, including the FBI, need to revise bureaucratic mindsets and catch up to these new threats and our new reality in their investigative efforts, as suggested by former DEA Administrator and FBI Chief of Staff Chuck Rosenberg. Now, Attorney General Garland said recently, in reference to his role as the lead prosecutor in the 1995 Oklahoma City bombing case, quote, I have a chance to lead a department that needs to fight against domestic violent extremists so that the kind of tragedy that we had in Oklahoma City doesn't occur, unquote. We on the subcommittee want to help the Attorney General and the Department of Justice in this fight. To do that, we welcome two senior leaders from the Department of Justice. Executive Assistant Director Jill Sanborn leads the FBI National Security Branch, and she is a veteran of the efforts to deal with terrorism at home and abroad and was the first woman to lead the FBI's Counterterrorism Directorate. Deputy Assistant Attorney General Brad Wigman represents the National Security Division, which was established in 2006 to consolidate the department's primary national security operations and to ensure that federal counterintelligence and counterterrorism activities do not violate the law. And for today, so that we are all on the same page in describing domestic terrorism, we will use the definition the FBI provided in a July 2020 report to the subcommittee, which described, quote, domestic violent extremists, unquote, as those who pose a persistent threat of violence and economic harm, but distinct from those connected with international terrorism. And of these, the greatest threat is from, quote, racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, unquote, especially white supremacists. But because this hearing is in open session, we understand many matters of interest to the subcommittee may be too sensitive to discuss in detail. I believe we can have a fruitful and informative session at the unclassified level, but should some answers need to be handled under secure procedures, this subcommittee can certainly accommodate that requirement as well. Executive Assistant Director Sanborn and Deputy Assistant Attorney General Wigman, we look forward to your testimony. And now I yield to the ranking member uh, for his opening statement. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. It uh, is uh, good to be with you today, along with our subcommittee uh, members, uh, even though we're here, we're virtually meeting today, but uh, on this very important topic of uh, domestic violent extremism. And I, I do appreciate uh, our witnesses from the FBI who have joined us today uh, and the Department of Justice. Uh, so we welcome both of you for uh, taking time to uh, meet with us uh, this morning. Uh, our First Amendment guarantees every American the right to speak freely and assemble peacefully. And I've always supported peaceful protest and, and of course, the right to peaceful protest. Unfortunately, uh, over the past year, we have seen stark examples of extremists using tragedies and other notable events to, dis to disguise their attempts to incite and to engage in violence and even domestic terrorism. All forms of domestic terrorism must be condemned, including violent extremism from the political left, like that which has alarmed the mayor of Portland, Maine, but also threats such as the violence associated with white supremacy. I hope that this hearing this morning is an opportunity to discuss the purported rise of domestic terrorism in the United States, evaluate the role of the federal government in combating domestic terrorism, and discuss potential solutions to, do, to address all forms of domestic terrorism. We can't surrender American cities or the safety of our communities to extremists who seek to intimidate, 
who seek to coerce or assault our American citizens. We must find ways to mitigate the simmering threat of violent extremists through measures that help promote de-radicalization, reduce violent extremism, and prevent violence that is driven by ideology, all while at the same time preserving American rights to hold sometimes unpopular views. Today, I look forward to uh, hearing about the efforts of the FBI Joint Terrorism Task Forces, the role of the U.S. Attorney Anti-Terrorism Advisory Councils, and how the Department of Justice coordinates the interagency partners to mitigate domestic terrorism threats. I also look forward to hearing what the Justice Department has learned and implemented as a result of 10 years of funding uh, for research on domestic radicalization at the National Institute of Justice, including the degree at which, in which abuse, trauma, economic struggles, bullying, and discrimination can, can lead some individuals to actually be radicalized. We also need to discuss whether the Department has the proper resources in place to address these threats that are posed by violent extremists. If not today, then uh, we will have this opportunity when the Attorney General appeared before our committee uh, in the coming days. America is governed by law, not violence. It is not governed by intimidation nor mobs. We must deal with this problem with the seriousness that it deserves. Assistant uh, Director Sanborn, Deputy Assistant Attorney General Wigman, thank you for both being here today to testify. I look forward to your testimony. Again, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for yielding, and I look forward to the hearing. Uh, thank you, Mr. Adderholt. Uh, and at this time, uh, we're going to recognize our witnesses for testimony. Um, and uh, Executive Assistant Director Sanborn, uh, you are recognized for five minutes. Uh, uh, keep your eye on the clock. Uh, we prefer you don't go over and always remember that your entire written testimony will be submitted for the record so you don't have to feel like you left out any points. Uh, you are recognized for five minutes, uh, Executive Assistant Director Shanborn. Good morning, Chairman Cartwright, Ranking Member Adderholt, and members of the subcommittee. It's an honor to be here with you today. As I told your Senate colleagues in a hearing last month, I'm always excited to have the opportunity to speak with you because I actually started my career in public service as a Senate page in 1987. Before I get too far into my testimony today, I wanna to take a minute to offer my condolences to all of you and the officers who serve the United States Capitol Police and the Washington DC Metropolitan Police Department who had to endure up close and personally the violence and destruction that occurred on January 6th. The siege on the Capitol complex while you were carrying out your duties as our elected representatives was not just unacceptable and disturbing, it was criminal. Violence designed to intimidate the population and influence the government is exactly what the FBI's counterterrorism division was designed to combat. And the American people deserve nothing less than our commitment to see this investigation through, and maybe even more importantly, to prevent acts of violence like this in the future because the FBI's number one priority is preventing acts of terrorism from any place by any actor. Across the board, the greatest terrorism threat we face is the threat posed by lone actors, both domestic violent extremists and homegrown violent extremists. These actors are especially challenging for law enforcement because by definition, their insular nature makes them particularly difficult to identify and disrupt before they have an opportunity to act. I know today you are particularly interested in talking about domestic terrorism, and I appreciate your attention to this threat. The FBI has been investigating domestic terrorism throughout our organization's history, but today's threat is different than it was years ago and continues to evolve. And just in the last year, we have surged resources to our domestic terrorism investigations to counter this threat, representing a 260% increase in domestic terrorism personnel. Let me walk you through some of the themes we're looking at. 2019 was the most fatal year for domestic violent extremist attacks since the Oklahoma City bombing in 1995. And as you know, the 26th anniversary of that bombing was just last week. Between 2015 and 2020, racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists were responsible for the most fatal domestic terrorism attacks. However, three of the four fatal domestic extremist attacks in 2020 were perpetrated by anti-government or anti-authority violent extremists. 
One of those attacks was perpetrated by an anarchist violent extremist in Portland, Oregon, which was actually the first fatal anarchist violent extremist attack in over 20 years. Looking forward, we assess domestic violent extremists will continue to pose an elevated threat of violence to the United States. We expect racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists and anti-government or anti-authority violent extremists will very likely pose the greatest domestic terrorism threats throughout 2020 and likely into 2022. At the same time, it's important to note that the threats from international terrorism have not diminished. Rather, as we, heard, as we head into 2021, potentially for the first time in my 20 years, the threats from domestic terrorism, Salafi jihadism, and state-sponsored terrorism are all elevated simultaneously. As we work to counter these threats, I want to underscore the importance of partnerships to the counterterrorism fight. Our investigations and disruptions rely on our cooperation with our federal, state, and local law enforcement partners, as well as the communities we serve. In fiscal year 2020 alone, the FBI-led Joint Terrorism Task Forces across the country, representing the states that you all represent, arrested 235 terrorism subjects, both international and domestic. Just to highlight a few of those, in March of 2020, we disrupted a racially or ethnically motivated violent extremist who advocated for the superiority of the white race who was plotting to bomb a Missouri hospital. Last May, we arrested a Florida-based individual who was planning and attempting to carry out an attack on behalf of ISIS. In June, we arrested a Kentucky-based U.S. soldier who was planning a deadly attack on his army unit by disclosing sensitive information to multiple extremists to include individuals associated with racially or ethnically motivated violent extremism and Al-Qaeda. Late, later in October, we prevented multiple militia violent extremists from executing a plan to kidnap the governor of Michigan in response to COVID-19 policies. Lastly, in November, initially based on a tip we received from our foreign law enforcement partners, we arrested a New York-based militia violent extremist for making threatening interstate communications towards New York Senator Schumer. We also continue to expand our partnerships in academia, the private sector, and within the communities we serve. This is critical because nearly half of our cases are predicated on tips from the public or referrals from other law enforcement agencies. I also wanna take this opportunity to reemphasize the FBI's mission to uphold the constitution, protect the American people. This is dual and simultaneous and not contradictory. That said, when a person crosses a line from expressing beliefs to violating federal law, we aggressively pursue those threats. I want to conclude my remarks by expressing the FBI's appreciation for the support that you have provided and continue to provide the men and women of the FBI. I look forward to answering any questions you might have. Well, uh, thank you, Ms. Sanborn. Uh, and at this time, we recognize Deputy Assistant Attorney General Wigman for five minutes of testimony and the same my request goes to you, uh, Mr. Wigman, uh, please keep your remarks to five minutes and remember your entire written submission will be included in the record. You're recognized. Thank you, Chairman Cartwright, Ranking Member Adderholt, members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to testify today about the work being done by the Department of Justice to counter domestic terrorism. As has been said, the events of January 6th have underscored that domestic terrorism continues to pose a significant threat to the public and to the rule of law. The attack on our nation's capital was an intolerable assault on a fundamental institution of our democracy. It showed an appalling disregard for our institutions of government and the safety of legislators, law enforcement, and the public. Since that day, DOJ and the FBI have launched an extraordinary effort to hold accountable all those who engaged in criminal acts at the Capitol. The investigation spanned almost the entire country, and agents and prosecutors in multiple states are a vital part of it. The prosecution efforts are being led by the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Columbia. More than 430 individuals have been charged thus far, and that number continues to grow. We have also recently witnessed efforts to intimidate members of our communities, apparently based only on who they are, as has been the case with recent horrific attacks directed at Asian Americans. The Department and the FBI are fully supporting state and local investigations into those attacks, while assessing whether federal hate crimes were involved. Regardless of the motivation, our goals at DOJ are to prevent such attacks and to bring those responsible to justice. Today, I'd like to give you just a brief overview of how the Department of Justice is organized to handle domestic terrorism cases and the legal authorities on which we rely. 
We use all of the tools at our disposal to take a holistic approach to combating this threat. On the front lines are our 94 U.S. Attorney's offices. Each office coordinates a group of federal, state, and local law enforcement in the district called the Anti-Terrorism Advisory Council, or ATAC. The ATAC works in close partnership with its corresponding FBI Joint Terrorism Task Force. The ATACs promote training and information sharing among federal, state, and local law enforcement. Each U.S. Attorney's Office also has a senior prosecutor who serves as the ATAC coordinator. This designee is specially trained and serves as the lead counterterrorism prosecutor for the district. Many offices have also designated national security sections that focus on counterterrorism and other national security threats. At Maine Justice here in Washington, the National Security Division, of which I'm a part, was created in 2006 to integrate the department's national security work nationwide. We have a counterterrorism section with more than 35 attorneys, all of whom are equipped to work on both domestic and international terrorism matters. We also have a Council for Domestic Terrorism and four domestic terrorism coordinators. Department policy now requires notification to the National Security Division of any investigations or prosecutions with a nexus to domestic terrorism, and NSD attorneys coordinate and provide assistance in those matters. In addition, other divisions of the department play an important role. For example, the Civil Rights Division is responsible for overseeing the prosecution of hate crimes, some of which may also qualify as acts of domestic terrorism. Turning to our legal authorities, we have prosecuted domestic terrorists using a wide range of criminal statutes. These include weapons and explosive charges, threat, hoax, or riot charges, and charges prescribing attacks on federal officials and facilities. As I mentioned, hate crimes charges may also be appropriate where conduct is motivated by bias against a race, religion, or ethnic minority. We also work closely with our state and local partners to confront domestic terrorism. Some cases are best prosecuted under state law, and in those circumstances, we support our state and local partners where we can. While there is no single federal crime labeled domestic terrorism, the criminal code does include a definition of domestic terrorism, as well as federal crime of terrorism. These definitions provide us with an array of expanded authorities. For example, judges can issue nationwide search warrants. Government attorneys have additional authority to share grand jury information. And Congress has created a presumption of pretrial detention for terrorism offenses. And finally, the sentencing guidelines also provide a significant enhancement for these offenses. In my written testimony, I've provided a number of examples of recent cases that we've brought. Consistent with longstanding department policy, our practice is always to charge and pursue the most serious, readily approvable offense available based on the facts of the case. It's important to emphasize that we prosecute individuals for their criminal acts, not for their beliefs or associations. The FBI may not investigate solely on the basis of First Amendment protected activity, but the FBI will pursue and DOJ will prosecute those who use violence in violation of federal law in attempt to further their ideological goals. With that, I will close. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss these issues today and look forward to answering your questions. Thank you, Mr. Wigman. Uh, we proceed now to the question and answer session. Um, I, I'll recognize, recognize myself first for five minutes, uh, then go to Ranking Member Adderholt, and then we'll go back and forth uh, between uh, Democrats and Republicans uh, for the full, the full first round, and then probably proceed to a second round as well. Recognize myself for five minutes. Assistant Director Sanborn, uh, we have to talk about definitions, uh, as, as uh, Mr. Wigman just mentioned. I understand the FBI applies the term domestic terrorism to criminal acts that violate federal law, in particular 18 United States Code, that's the Crimes Code, Section 2331, Subpart 5, primarily within the territorial jurisdiction of the United States, which represent more than simply First Amendment protected speech, no matter how vitriolic or hateful. Um, Ms. Sanborn, is that an accurate description of the FBI's approach to the definition of domestic terrorism? Yes, sir, the definition is defined by 2331. Okay, so uh, here's a question for the both of you. Um, 
In an unclassified March 2021 summary, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence stated that, quote, domestic violent extremists, DVEs, who are motivated by a range of ideologies and galvanized by recent political and societal events in the United States, pose an elevated threat to the homeland in 2021. Uh, uh, for each of you, do you concur with that assessment? I'll start. Uh, this is Jill. Uh, we definitely uh, we published some recent uh, products saying just that. So yes, sir, we do agree that that is something that we should pay attention to as we go into the future. Thank you, Ms. Sandberg. Mr. Wigman. I agree. That's my understanding as well. Okay. So this month, the Washington Post reported based on multi-year data collected by the Center for Strategic and International Studies that incidents of domestic terrorism have, quote, soared to new highs in the United States, driven chiefly by white supremacist, anti-Muslim and anti-government extremists on the far right. Uh, again, uh, a toss up for both of you. Do you agree with that analysis? And if not, could you elaborate? Sir, I'll start. Um, I'm not familiar specifically with the CSIS analysis, uh, but 2019 was the deadliest year since Oklahoma City bombing. So, yes, we've definitely seen an increase in lethality. Um, and the trend that I mentioned in my opening, interestingly, last year, the majority of the attacks were from uh, those who espouse anti-government, anti-authority, violent extremists. Okay. And Mr. Wigman? I really would defer to the FBI, but that's my understanding as well, is that there has been an increase and it's been attributable both to racially motivated, violent extremists and anti-government and anti-authority extremists. All right. Uh, extremists of all varieties use hate speech and social media to motivate and indoctrinate and in some cases conspire to commit or facilitate violence while expressing hateful ideas may have First Amendment protection, it is also black letter law that the First Amendment prohibits governmental sanctioning of speech unless that speech incites, quote, imminent lawless action and is likely to incite such, such action, unquote. Drawing a line between what is free expression and what is terrorism is something we are clearly still struggling with. Uh, possibly because there are numerous types of groups. There seem to be many different popular perceptions of what violent extremism and terrorism mean. Government agencies need legal clarity. In your opinions, are the current legal and practical definitions of domestic terrorism and violent extremism working? And if not, what areas do you see as problematic and in need of improvement or clarification? We'll start with you, Ms. Sanborn. So I would actually uh, defer to Mr. Wagman on this, but I think you pointed out what we believe is a challenge for us, which is separating uh, where hateful speech is just speech and where that's turned to planning and plotting. And that's why we try to focus so much on the indicators of behavior changing. Thank you. And you are deferred to, Mr. Wigman. So I think we're comfortable with the definitions that we have in the U.S. Code today. There are uh, always some gray areas, as you pointed out, with respect to um, when do you cross that line from uh, speech, let's say, to a true threat or to incitement. But those are things where the courts have given us guidance. Uh, and uh, they're, they're things that we work with in our prosecutions on a, on a regular basis and have done for many years. Well, thank you for that. And my time has expired, so I'm going to uh, I'm going to uh, yield to our uh, distinguished ranking member, Mr. Adderall, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and again, thanks for uh, both of our uh, uh, guests being here today uh, before uh, our committee virtually. Uh, as um, Mr. Wigman had noted, uh, it was domestic terrorist. Uh, who shot and injured four people at the congressional baseball practice back in 2017, uh, including was that included in that injuries was uh, the majority whip at the time, Steve Scalise, and, and uh, a lobbyist that was uh, working with uh, the baseball team, uh, Matt Micah. Uh, they were both critically uh, wounded. 
Uh, the shooter was a deranged uh, supporter of Bernie Sanders who had uh, actually, my understanding, had a list of Republican members of Congress in his pocket when he actually ambushed the group. Uh, some of us learned just last week that the FBI classified the 2017 congressional baseball shooting as a suicide by cop. Um, and as my colleague uh, Brad Winstrup has stated, uh, classifying the attack uh, suicide by cop is really defies logic. Uh, Ms. Sanborn, uh, has the FBI cleared up this uh, by recla reclassifying the incident as an act of domestic uh, terrorism? Uh, thank you for the question. It's fair to say that the shooter was motivated by a desire to commit an attack on members of Congress, and then knowing by doing so he would likely be killed in the process. Um, cases like this are challenging because there were, as you mentioned, a couple clues left behind, but he died in the process, never allowing us to fully examine through, say, an interview his motivation. This is also a good example of what I'll talk about probably as we go on today with a trend that we started to see probably 2016-ish, which is that the motivation and sort of the, uh, what drove somebody to mobilize is a very personalized grievance that they hold, which is something different um, from the domestic terrorism threat that we saw in years past. There's also indicators that the shooter intended for the shooting to be his final act on earth. But those things are not inconsistent with someone who is motivated by a variety of factors to commit violent acts based on a blend of ideological or personal motivations. And this conduct is something that today we would characterize as a domestic terrorism event. Okay, so, so it is being considered an act of domestic terrorism? There, if it were to happen today, we would open this as a domestic terrorism uh, case. What was the rationale behind the decision not to classify it as domestic terrorism? I, I, I'm not aware of the rationale. I, I was not in my seat at the time, um, so I would have to get back to you on the specifics of what that rationale was. But in, in going back and looking at it, um, and honestly, the trend we've seen of sort of that personalized grievance motivation, it fits squarely into the phenomena that the director and I have talked about often, which is this very personalized sort of blending of ideologies that motivate somebody. Yeah, I think we'd be interested in knowing just what the rationale was. If you could prevent, uh, pr uh, provide that for us, would be great. Uh, D Director Ray has said that uh, social media has become, in many ways, the key amplifier to domestic uh, violent extremism, just as it has for evil foreign influence. Uh, I'll address this question to you, uh, Mr. Wigman. When social media platforms kick uh, offensive groups off their sites, is it make it more difficult for the FBI to monitor and track the behavior and threats? I would actually look to uh, Ms. Sanborn to answer that question. Okay. Yes, sir. Social media definitely has increased the speed and dissemination of violent uh, material online. And so that definitely, uh, because of its existence of speed, the amount of rhetoric, as I mentioned previously, there's definitely a challenge for us in trying to filter through all the noise out there um, and figure out what individual may actually have the intent to then take their hate-fueled, you know, free speech farther into an act of breaking federal law. What would you consider more dangerous, uh, and any of the one of you could answer this, but if, uh, dangerous domestic violent extremists promoting violence in the open or underground, such as on the dark web? I think the method that they express their uh, intent um, doesn't necessarily make one more dangerous than the other. I think the, what I would put out there for you, something to think about, is it would propose a challenge to us, right? Like, we have the potential, and again, half of our cases are generated on tips and leads, um, thankfully, to partners and community members. If it's not something that we see, that potential tip or lead, and if we can't get to it with a lawful warrant, is something that could go unnoticed and unprevented. So sort of the dark web encrypted, unable to get to, poses definitely probably a greater challenge for us because of that inability. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I see my time has uh, elapsed. Thank you, Mr. Adderholt. And uh, the chair recognizes Representative Grace Meng for five minutes of questions. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to our witnesses for your work and for being here today. I actually wanted to follow up on Mr. Adderholt's questioning about social media. Um, platforms like Twitter and Facebook have really played a central role in elevating uh, conspiracy theories, hate, bigotry. And while these some of these companies have occasionally banned from their platforms certain individuals or dangerous rhetoric, uh, there are still other social media apps like a parlor, telegraph, or even signal. And I just wanted to know um, what some of these companies can do. Um, and I know that I've heard that Platforms like Signal, for example, are even harder to uh, sort of monitor. So what can these companies do better and what can Congress do? And second part of this question, are there any noticeable trends after the January 6th insurrection that you're seeing with how domestic right wing groups are using some of these platforms? Yeah, thank you for the question. I'll start, you know, um, we have a very good relationship with uh, a lot of the uh, private sector partners that you uh, mentioned in your question. And so that uh, relationship is always increasing and I'm encouraged by the cooperation with them. And I think one of the important things about the partnership that we have with them that we've learned is very fruitful is when we can educate them on the things that they should be worried about, the threats that we collectively are facing, it allows them to be very thoughtful and mindful about that when they build out, say, a terms of use agreement with the user. And so I think that that is one way that we are partnering with them. In fact, there's a specific section inside the counterterrorism division that focuses on nothing but those sort of strategic private sector partners. As far as the second half of your question on trends, I don't know that it's unique or anything new, but oftentimes across both international and domestic terrorism, uh, we see individuals potentially initiate their first sort of relationship or connection with say a like-minded individual in the open sort of social media forum but then often they look to move those conversations to some sort of encrypted application um thank you um i also wanted to ask about of some of these right-wing extremist groups there are anecdotes of affinities between American-based right-wing groups um, and those abroad. Um, they may feed off each other. Um, and while we can ban certain individuals from visiting the US, we can't stop their hateful ideas from proliferating across the internet. Um, so I just wanted to ask about your concerns about domestic groups potentially sharing info with international groups and vice versa. And are there gaps in your efforts to understand um, some of these efforts? And you know, what additional resources or personnel could you need? Yeah, thank you very much for that question. I mean, I, I would tell you, having grown up sort of working I, international terrorism for most of my career, I'll never be at a point where I think I have the intel I need. I always want more, so there's always gaps. Um, I'd also say we don't necessarily, I think it's important to lay this foundation, we do not investigate ideology or groups, but to your question about sort of the foreign connection, obviously, and this is across all threats that the FBI faces, the internet poses the potential and allows for the facilitation of like-minded individuals to link up across the globe. And so we are always looking for individuals here in the United States that may be reaching out to uh, foreign entities and using that link up to then incite violence or mobilize to violence here in the United States. And so one of the ways we tackle that is with our legal attache program and try to work very closely with our foreign partners to see what indicators and warnings we can get of potential violence, not only here in the United States, but overseas. Thank you, I yield back. Thank you, Representative Meng. Uh, at this time, uh, the chair recognizes Congressman Klein for five minutes of questions. Uh, we may have to bounce back to Mr. Klein. Uh, and so in default of him, uh, we, the chair recognizes Mr. Garcia for five minutes of 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, with respect to Mr. Klein, I see he's online now. I need to cut in front of him uh, unnecessarily here, seeing him, but if we want to go back. I uh, defer and yield back to Mr. Klein, if that's all right. Mr. Klein is recognized for five minutes. Nice to have you, have you back, Mr. Klein. Oh, I think we scared him off, Mr. Garcia. All right. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. Back to you. Uh, thank Mr. you. Uh, oh, there he is again, Mr. Cl oh, there he is. <laughs> now, we're, we're going to go with you, Mr. Garcia. Go ahead, five minutes. Sounds good, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, thank you both for your, your testimony and your service to, to our nation. Uh, it, just a level set us. We were kind of hitting on the edges of the definition of domestic terrorism. Can, can one of you uh, please just uh, recite the language I'm seeing in the package that was brought forth on page six. There is a definition, but I want to just make sure that we're all on the same page. Maybe Ms. Sanborn, if, you, if you're able to do that. I can do that. I have it right in front of me. Okay. So it's, it's in, he had 18 U.S. Code 2331, Section 5, and it, I'll just read it. The term domestic terrorism means activities that involve acts dangerous to human life that are a violation of the criminal laws of the United States or of any state, they, and they must appear to be intended either, one, to intimidate or coerce a civilian population, two, to influence the policy of a government by intimidation or coercion, or three, to affect the conduct of a government by mass destruction, assassination, or kidnapping, and then finally, they must occur within the territorial jurisdiction of the United States. Great. Thank you for, uh, for, for level setting us there. Uh, would, would you agree that this definition applies to the entire political spectrum, uh, not just the far right, but also uh, the far left and any American or any threat to American lives in between? Absolutely. And, and would, you, would you agree also that, that this applies to all races and all, all ethnicities? Uh, Mr. Wegman, you, you mentioned that this was focused primarily on actions taken against uh, ethnic minorities in your words, but the reality is this legislation, this, 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 this law, uh, I should say, is actually applicable to protecting all Americans. Is that an accurate statement? Totally correct. It, it would be uh, on race, on whatever the race might be, uh, uh, would be covered, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and so my question is, relative to what we've seen over the course of the last year and a half in cities like Portland, uh, Seattle, and Minneapolis, where we have organizations and individuals uh, uh, not just protesting, which is obviously constitutional and encouraged, peaceful protests are the, the core of our American heritage and should be encouraged, but these protests have, have devolved into riots, uh, looting the destructions of, of small businesses, um, the occupation in many times of cities and suburbs and, and small segments of metropolitan areas with the interest of uh, intimidating or coercing, or coercing uh, a civilian population of influencing the policy of governments uh, by intimidation or coercion uh, and to affect the conduct of a government uh, by mass destruction, assassination or kidnapping. I think there's been uh, murders in several of these cities. Are these, are these riots and destruction in these various metropolitan areas like Portland, Seattle, and Minneapolis being treated as acts of uh, domestic terrorists as defined by uh, the, the law as you, as you describe? So I, do, I do believe the, uh, the previous attorney general did conclude that some of those acts were uh, qualified as domestic terrorism. And what we would do in any case is apply the evidence uh, in any specific case uh, against this legal standard, and if it meets that legal standard, absolutely, it would be considered domestic terrorism. Do you have any idea how many active charges or cases are actually in, in the system right now for domestic terrorism relative to uh, the riots in, in the various metropolitan areas? So again, as I explained earlier in my testimony, there isn't a federal domestic terrorism charge. There are typically sure. different types of charges. It could be riots, it could be threats, it could be assaulting a federal officer, et cetera. So there's not necessarily on the face of the charges indication as to whether in that particular case uh, it qualifies as domestic terrorism. So that would be individualized based on each case. But I do know that there were several hundred charges brought as a result of unrest over the last summer between May and let's say September. So there were several hundred federal charges. Uh, I, don't, I don't know the number of state charges. Okay. And then just to help us uh, put, to, put to bed or, or, or help uh, in the debate of an issue that we've seen is, is, is a statement from a sitting official, elected official, uh, whether a member of Congress or state legislature, uh, 
along the lines of we, we need to become more confrontational in our protests uh, in the midst of a heated environment uh, around race issues. Would, would you consider that to fall underneath the definition of uh, the criminal code, as you described earlier, domestic terrorism? Uh, again, I, I, in general, I wouldn't want to comment on hypotheticals, but on that, it clearly wouldn't meet the definition because it's not an app dangerous to human life or anything like that. So um, there's not coercion in, in inferences in that statement. I would not think that statement alone would, would, would qualify. OK, thank you, sir. I, I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. Uh, at this time, the chair recognizes Representative Chris for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, appreciate the hearing and the opportunity to be here. Um, Ms. Sanborn, uh, an incident involving the neo-Nazi organization Adam Waffen hit pretty close to home for my constituents in 2017. In neighboring Tampa, a double murder occurred at a house where four members of the organization lived when one of the members turned on two others. When they looked in the house, in addition to firearms cache, they found buckets of explosives. You probably know better than myself, Ms. Sanborn, but to my knowledge, these people were not the, on the authorities' radar, despite their recruitment and planning being done online. And who knows what would have happened if they had not turned on one another. Uh, so my question, it seems to me, that my constituents in the Tampa area are pretty lucky that nothing worse did happen. Has anything changed over the last four years, to your knowledge, uh, to keep the situation I described from happening again? Sir, I think, I mean, you, we've talked about this a little bit. I think the biggest challenge we face is how do we get the indicators and warnings? How do we get the tip, the lead, that exactly what you mentioned those individuals were plotting to do? Um, we rely heavily, in, and this is something that we use our heavy amount of our research for, is having sources and undercovers that can help us get that information or educating the community that can pay attention to that and warn us of something they might have seen that is just out of sorts. And so you definitely pinpoint the challenge for us in trying to get those indicators and warnings and what we really need to, to get to the bottom of that. Thank you very much. Uh, recently, the water treatment plant in Oldsmar, Florida, right next to my district, was hacked. Uh, whoever hacked the plant raised the sodium hydroxide levels, the main ingredient in a drain cleaner, from 100 parts per million to about 11,000 per minute. I understand that at that level it's considered corrosive to any human tissue that it might touch. While a plant operator noticed the hack and was able to correct it, it does raise questions about cybersecurity for facilities in places like Oldsmar that don't have the security resources of larger cities and whether or not they are targets for terrorism and violent extremism. Uh, for either witness, uh, how does the work you do to prevent terrorism apply to preventing cyber terrorism in communities that are smaller, such as Oldsmar, Florida? Sir, I'll start. I think um, you present, I think, a very important point. Uh, not only are the elevation of uh, the threats that I outlined in my opening high, but we're also at a time when the threats from China, Russia, as well as the threats we face from cyber in general, also very high. We work that very closely with our cyber division. And again, one of our biggest uh, tools in our toolbox outside the Joint Terrorism Task Force is really those partnerships with the private sector. And so our sort of helping them understand potential vulnerabilities and working with them is probably the best defense we have to defend any of their networks against any actor. Thank you very much. Um, for either witness, uh, if somebody under investigation for their ties to violent extremism or domestic terrorism, and they have not yet been charged with a crime that prohibits them from purchasing a firearm. Will their ties to domestic terrorism be flagged if they attempt to purchase an assault weapon? And would they be prevented from purchasing one? Also, would you be notified if a subject of an investigation has purchased a firearm? I'll start and then Brad, if you wanna chime in with anything on your side. Sir, I, I do know that if there 
outright prohibited possessor that there's definitely red flags that would put that on our radar. I'd have to get back to you on just the sheer presence of them being, you know, an assessment or a case, whether or not that would be a red flag. I don't have the granularity to give you the specifics on that if you would uh, follow up on that. Oh, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, I'm running to the end of my time. So, Mr. Chairman, I will yield back and thank you and thank both the witnesses. Thank you, Mr. Kruger. <laughs> At this time, the chair recognizes Representative Klein for five minutes of questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Am I coming through? We, we can. Uh, yes. Don't touch anything. It's working now. <laughs> I apologize. I appreciate the patience. Um, Ensuring the security of the American people is the primary duty of all members of Congress, and it's imperative that we're doing everything possible to prevent attacks on the citizens of our nation. Violence committed by any individual or group has no place in our society, and Congress must ensure that law enforcement is working efficiently and effectively to combat an ever-changing landscape of threats. Uh, Ms. Sanborn, uh, through 2020, throughout the, the last year, the FBI observed activity that indicated there was the potential for increased violent extremist activity at lawful protests taking place in communities all across the United States. Has the FBI determined what contributing factors led to this uptick in potential? Uh, sir, that's a great question. And I alluded to a little bit of it um, in my opening and I think the answer to the uh, baseball game question really pinpointing what is driving somebody to mobilize and commit their acts of violence is incredibly complex in general, but more so probably in the domestic violent extremist space than any others. Because what we found as we go back and we look at post incident is it's a blend of their ideology, but oftentimes really partnered closely with a personalized grievance. And so, as you can imagine, that makes uh, it very hard to figure out what truly was the motivating factor in pushing them to mobilization. And so that's an incredible challenge for us because of that personalized nature. Was this the fact um, when you were looking at extremist activity at lawful protests on both or across the political spectrum? Um, were these contributing factors existing uh, no matter whether it was on the right or the left uh, because we had those protests on both the right and the left uh, taking place across the United States? Yes, sir, exactly. Trying to figure out um, throughout the whole country in 2020, what was the specific mobilization factor for each case that we looked at was incredibly challenging. And oftentimes, like I said, very personalized. And you know, depending on if they interviewed with us and if they told us what that mobilization factor is, um, very unlikely that we may ever get to the real bottom of what motivated them that day. And all right, can you talk about what the FBI has done to counteract domestic violence extremists? And if these groups are on the rise, uh, how will the FBI work to prevent future attacks? Yes, sir, that's a great question. Uh, again, the majority of what we do outside investigative techniques, and I'll hit on that as a, in a second, is really educating the community, right? Half of our cases are predicated on a tip and a lead from somebody in the community or another law enforcement partner seeing something that rises to the level of telling us. And that happens time and time and again. And I would say the more we do that, the better, right? If we can kick that 50% to a 60 or a 70, that's great. And so that's an effort well worth our time. But also it's using our resources, especially when you think about the potential uh, issues with encryption and collection on the technical side. How do we get more sources and undercovers in the right places? You know, very similar to the Michigan plot. How do we get people in the right space that can tell us about a plot that's in the making? Right. Um, while still going through the appropriate legal procedures, obtaining court orders before uh, sifting through the NSA's collection of communications, things like that, correct? Yes, sir. Um, Ms. Sanborn, Director Ray has stated that the greatest threat we face in the homeland is that posed by lone actors radicalized online who look to attack soft targets. Can you tell me what the FBI is doing to combat this disturbing trend and are additional tools needed 
to prevent radicalized individuals from terrorizing our communities. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that speaks to the insular nature. It's very hard when somebody can uh, be online in the privacy of their home and sort of come up with whatever their plot might be and actually even mobilize, acquire a weapon, acquire a knife, whatever it happens to be without any indicators and warnings that they're doing that. So that is a, a challenge for us. Uh, I think with resources, some of the things we could do better uh, potentially is data analytics, right? When I was a case agent, the most voluminous data I might come across would be hundreds of pages of telephone records. Our case agents today are faced with um, petabytes of information that comes from a plethora of avenues, PayPal, Snapchat, WhatsApp, and so we're sifting and trying to sift through an enormous amount of data to look just for exactly the kinds of things that you're talking about. All right, thank you, Mr. Chairman, with that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Klein. The chair recognizes Mr. Case for five minutes of questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, to the witnesses, um, this being appropriations, my basic question is, uh, do you think you have the resources you need to do your job, especially um, as it seems to have be become so much more critical, especially in the past couple of months? Uh, and so, Ms. Sanborn, let me just uh, kind of start with you. I, I think I heard you say during your testimony that you had, you had seen a 260% increase in domestic terrorism personnel. Um, I, think, I think it was year over year, if I'm not mistaken. I'm looking at I'm looking at the budget numbers, and I and I think I understand this correctly that your your department, uh, DOJ counterterrorism, um, started in FY 20, in 2019 at 1.235 billion, FY 21 1.294 billion for a five percent over two years. That just seems to me to be pretty insufficient given what's happened in the last number of years. Um, I, are, is that a fair um, statement? Are you are you, you you made the comment earlier that you could always use more resources, and of course we can always use use more resources. Kind of a difference between, you know, want and critical need. Um, so I'm asking for your assessment. Is, is is are you asking for a significant increase in terms of your FY22 budget? So I'll I'll let Brad comment um, after I'm done, and I'll try to you know stay away from the specific appropriation conversations uh, as my role as AD, but just to highlight a few things is the 260% personnel increase that we talked about was just last year alone, uh, and the cases doubled last year, right? So both the effort and cases are increasing. And what I would just leave you with is, while we are aggressively trying to do that, and I think the surge in our arrest numbers show you we're trying to get ahead of that, that's not really a recipe for a long-term strategic prevention approach for the FBI. And some of the things that more resources would get us, um, which we've kind of alluded to already, is better and more data analytics, more task force officers, um, the ability to create more sources, the ability to pay and have more undercover operations. And so if we had more resources, we would definitely um, be good stewards of those and use those things in those sort of categories that I put out. But Brad, defer to you on the formal sort of appropriation conversation. Yeah. So, um, as as was alluded to in my in my written testimony, um, the the president's request for FY22 uh, discretionary funding, which was released in April, does ask for additional resources to address the surge in uh, domestic terrorism threat. So it's for asking for another 101 million dollars in this area, which would be 45 million dollars for the FBI uh, for DT related investigations, 40 million dollars for U.S. Attorney's offices to handle uh, the increase in caseload, um, $12 million for the marshals, and uh, $4 million for National Institute of Justice for additional research. So that, that's the amount that the administration will be requesting as, as, an, as an increase. Over and above, I think, has already been some shifting of resources in the FY21 to uh, counter the threat as well, so. Okay, so 10% 10, 10 here on your, roughly, um, FY21 to FY22. Okay, um, let me ask you a kind of a broader question. I mean, I'm <clears throat> listening to listening to you, and and also uh, you know taking a look at some of the other budgets, such as Department of Homeland Security. One of the um, major conclusions of the post 9/11 commission was uh, stovepiping across too many departments uh, throughout government, uh, where there was no coordination, where intelligence was not shared, where 
where there was not um, any kind of central coordinating body. And, and we, we made corrections and, and perhaps the result has been mixed, but the conclusion was still, I think anybody would agree, was a valid one. Is that happening uh, in the area of domestic terrorism? Do you, do, you, do you perceive that there is a comparable situation here? I, you know, we, we, fund to D, we, we fund to DOJ, we fund to the uh, Department of Homeland Security, we fund a lot of places uh, from, from this perspective. Um, does there need to be a better coordination of those resources across departments or agencies of government? Do you, do you feel comfortable in the coordination? I'll start. It's not necessarily a resource answer per se, but um, having lived through 9-11 in the commission report, I can appreciate where you're coming from with that. And having been a detailee to the CIA for two years, I'm a very huge proponent of partnerships. I believe uh, that as we counter the domestic violent extremist threat, we really take near and dear to us our partnership with DHS as well as um, so the support we get from NCTC and our state and local partners. I don't think there's stylo silos and stovepipes. There's always room to sort of educate state and local partners of more indicators and warnings. And so I think that's room for you know growth for us is to continue those training efforts. But I don't think there's silos or stovepipes. I think the partnerships, when you look at the fact that we have over 2,000 state and local partners on the Joint Terrorism Task Forces across the country would represent just that, sir. Okay, thank you. My time's up, so I'll defer back. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Case. Uh, the chair recognizes Mr. Trone for five minutes of questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank uh, both our witnesses also for your service. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, during last month's Senate Judiciary hearing on this topic, uh, FBI Director uh, Ray stated, quote, racially motivated violent extremism, specifically a sort for advocates for the superiority of the white race is persistent, evolving threat. It's the biggest chunk of our racially motivated violent extremism cases for sure. And racially motivated violent extremism is the biggest chunk of our domestic terrorism portfolio, if you will. So Ms. Sandburn, uh, we talked a bit today already um, about the rise of this toxic discourse uh, this toxic disinformation. And I think you could expand more, we could hear more um, about the role of social media and what social media and even direct media, um, actual some of the networks who seem to think this is a good thing in radicalizing and recruiting individuals who are receptive to this extremist messaging. Yeah, I think we talked about it a little bit, but um, obviously social media has increased not only the speed, but the ability to disseminate and the accessibility of all kinds of violent uh, extremist rhetoric, both international and domestic. I am, again, uh, very uh, happy with the amount of cooperation that we get with the social media companies. We spend a lot of time. There's always, of course, room for growth on that, but as I mentioned, sort of educating them on what the threats are that we face allows them to be very thoughtful and mindful as they think about their terms of use. And I think that's a great sign and definitely a move forward. Um, what do you think though about uh, some of our networks actually have an opinion? It's no longer the news. Uh, it's instead their position and what they think the news means and are pushing people to the left or pushing people to the right. Uh, do you think that's, serves as sort of a backdrop, uh, a supporting mechanism to ferment these radicalized behavior, because a lot of information we're hearing on respected networks is clearly disinformation. Yeah, I think uh, that's an interesting topic. I don't really think I know enough specifically to have an opinion one way or the other, but I do think, you know, we talked about this a little bit briefly, but we really take heart to heart our dual-headed mission of protecting an individual's First Amendment rights as much as it is our right to protect the American people. And so we are very cognizant of um, trying to walk the line of really focusing on the violence and the intent and not focusing on necessarily the ideology or the even the assembly with like-minded individuals. We look really 
closely at trying to find that individual that's about ready to break federal law. Thank you. Um, how's the migration of the violent extremists uh, to the fringe, these encrypted platforms, uh, impacted your ability uh, amongst individuals and groups who share this ideology and talk more about what challenges it's creating uh, these encrypted platforms for law enforcement's ability to detect uh, domestic terrorist threats? Yeah, I think encrypted uh, communications definitely present a great challenge for us and will continue to do so as we go into the future. And while it's not a domestic violent extremist example, I think the best example I could throw out for you of that challenge is the attack in Pensacola, right? Like though that individual was talking with Al Qaeda up until the night before, and we were unable to get that information as quickly as you know, the citizens of, of this country should expect. And so encrypted communications and the inability with uh, lawful process to get those is probably one of the most significant challenges we face into the future. Uh, quickly, you're almost out of time, Mr. Wigman. Uh, what can Congress do to properly ensure that the resources we allocate to uh, protect our national security, while also while ensuring these resources are not later used to target the very communities that are the most vulnerable, that are perhaps the most overly surveilled already? Um, well. As Ms. Sanborn just explained, we have uh, strict rules about when we when we can uh, initiate an investigation. We have uh, the Attorney General's domestic um, operations guidelines. And FBI has implementing guidelines as well that are about a phone book, about a, a fixed set of rules that, that FBI strictly follows in terms of when they can initiate uh, investigate any investigative activity, what the standards are. It's detailed both for online activity and for operational activity. And I know that's something that the FBI takes very seriously and that would be for, for minority groups, majority groups, religion, race, any of those sensitive categories. We are super careful about um, how we conduct these investigations and, and making sure that we comply with uh, the constraints that don't have a chilling effect on First Amendment protected speech. Thank you, I yield back. Uh, thank you, Mr. Trone. Uh, we begin our, our next round of questioning and I wanna pick up for, from where uh, Mr. Trone left off. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, Christopher Ray did talk about uh, the rise of uh, right-wing violent extremism, and, and, and uh, this is what he said in addition to what Mr. Trone quoted. He said, when it comes to racially motivated violent extremism, that number, again, number of investigations and number of arrests has grown significantly on my watch. And the number of arrests, for example, of racially motivated violent extremists who are what you would categorize as white supremacists last year was almost triple the number it was in my first year as director. And uh, Ms. Sanborn, uh, is, is that a trend you've been seeing? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, and so, um, I guess the question is, uh, can either of you uh, identify which domestic violent extremist categories should receive the closest attention with some context as to how we should gauge their significance? And can you also explain the basis for identifying the categor categories you identified as deserving the most attention? Yes, sir, thank you for the question. This is a process I'm fairly passionate about, but we go through a process every year uh, to look at all of the threats that we face going into the next year. And we really think about, you know, what's the risk there and how can we uh, mitigate the risk? And as we went through that process this year, um, and actually it first started a couple of years ago with the director, we definitely see racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, the highest uh, domestic threat we face on par with ISIS and what we refer to as the homegrown violent extremists. Uh, that being said, that process has also shown us that anti-government, anti-authority is something we should pay attention to as it was right below those other um, top priority threats. All right. Um, the next question is, uh, estimating the number of persons 
who might be involved with, support, or be sympathetic to domestic violent extremism uh, objectives is, is certainly a difficult task given the need to protect civil liberties and acknowledging the problem of lone actors as we've touched on before. So for either witness, while you may not be able to provide any form of estimate of the number of persons who may be considered engaged in DVE related activity, could you say whether the FBI carries out such analysis? And if so, if more detail might be provided to the committee in a secure setting. Yes, sir. I, th I think what you're asking is how do we find sort of the unknowns, right? And I think we do that two different ways. We're constantly, again, using community outreach as well as our state and local partners for some referrals. But we also use our already predicated investigations, right? The same sort of network analysis that we would have done back in the day with gang and drug cases. We've, you know, continued applying those same tools in our toolbox to terrorism cases, and that includes domestic violent extremism. And so sort of target discovery of what that unknown threat might be from an individual is something that we dedicate uh, a significant amount of our resources to. Okay, uh, now uh, this question is for you, Mr. Wigman. Um, and it's, it's one suggested by uh, our colleague, uh, Congresswoman Brenda Lawrence of Michigan, who, who could not be with us. She's in transit right now. But she's interested in, in this and I am too. Uh, in, in the criminal code and the, the sentencing guidelines, it, is the involvement of domestic violent extremism, uh, is that taken into account? Uh, is that an aggravating factor as far as sentencing? Uh, walk us through that, if you will, Mr. Wigman. Yes, it, it is, absolutely. Um, in, in the U.S. Code, in 18 U.S.C. 2332, BG5 defines what is considered a federal crime of terrorism, and that could be domestic or international. And if it qualifies as a federal crime of terrorism, under the sentencing guidelines, you get a, a, a significant sentencing enhancement for offenses that involve a federal crime of terrorism, which can often increase the, uh, the guidelines range for that conduct to the statutory maximum. Um, there's also an upward departure for other offenses that could be uh, calculated to influence or affect the conduct of government by intimidation or or coercion. So absolutely, there is provision in, in the sentencing guidelines and in the U.S. Code for a sentencing enhancement for uh, terrorism matters. Thank you. Uh, my time's up, and I'm going to uh, yield the floor to our ranking member, Mr. Adelholt, for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> I will uh, direct the to uh, uh, Ms. Sanborn. Uh, all forms of domestic uh, terrorism must be condemned, and I think we, we all agree with that. And no one should agita uh, should tolerate agitators or extremists who plan to, vi to commit violence. Uh, does the FBI designate any domestic terrorist groups by name? No, sir. The FBI um, is not a part of any domestic terrorism uh, designation process. There, in my understanding, there does not one does not exist for the United States. Do you believe that the uh, mental health impacts uh, related to COVID-19 isolation have contributed to domestic, uh, the growth that we've seen in domestic uh, terrorism? I don't have any specific data related to COVID-19, but um, we definitely, this is something we work very closely with our state and local partners is just the me mental health in general um, across the country and the effects of that potentially on um, individuals and uh, the potential risk that could put somebody at to conduct acts of violence. And uh, and, I, and I will address this to either either one of you. In, in in the United States, of course, we depend on law enforcement to focus on actions uh, and not thoughts. Uh, what challenges does it present uh, as the Justice Department works uh, to conduct threat assessments? related to violent extremism when, uh, again, we focus on actions and we don't on thoughts. Yeah, I'll start, Brad, if you want to chime in. I think it definitely proposes, uh, poses kind of a big challenge for us, and I would say primarily the reason is, is because the amount of just sort of 
rhetoric out there in general and that rhetoric could be hateful. And so looking specifically for maybe that one sliver of this is an individual who's planning or plotting something is definitely a challenge because of the amount of data out there and being cognizant of individuals' rights. Well, let me, let me follow up on that. Given your extensive uh, experience in counterterrorism operations uh, over the years, what strategies do you think can be employed to prevent domestic terror without violating that, the actual privacy rights of American citizens? Thank you for that question. I think, again, really our see something, say something, right? Like community members, employers, uh, parents, et cetera. We have found that almost every single time, we call it the bystander phenomena, almost every single time somebody engages in an attack, when we go back and we interview family members and friends, they say, yes, I started to notice something. Something was just starting to change with this individual or not right. And so educating people and getting them to warn um, not only allows for potential prevention, but potentially allows us to get that person, if it's a mental health issue, right, help instead of um, them being jailed later on. So I definitely think the community and awareness and teaching them is our strongest tool. Thank you. Oh, sometimes uh, uh, politicians will, uh, in my opinion, inaccurately claim that President Trump called white supremacists fine people, um, and that can provoke uh, heated reactions. Um, for either witness, uh, do you believe that efforts to combat disinformation uh, can help to counteract the growth of domestic terrorism? I, I don't really have, I don't know a background or enough information to comment on like specific disinformation uh, avenues. I, I would just add, yeah, I, I do think that disinformation is something that we're concerned about in the administration, in other words, and the conspiracy theories and, and so forth are things that can contribute to uh, a culture of violence uh, in general. It's a difficult problem, but it, it is something that I think that, that you want to wrestle with, whether it's domestic terrorism or other types of violence, uh, just with the prevalence of social media and so forth. Um, it is something that, that, is, uh, that, that we need to be concerned about. What other uh, strategies do you think can be implemented to deter domestic terrorism in this political uh, climate that we live in that's very divided right now. Any thoughts on that? I mean, Brad, I'll let you chime in too, but I think, you know, people getting held accountable for their actions is a deterrent. And, you know, the great partnership we have with our prosecutors and holding people accountable, I think, can be a great deterrent for the future. So I agree with that. And then I would also just say on the other side of it is um, identifying people when people do do what Jill said and, and identify someone who they think is headed down a path towards violence. We have worked on uh, violence prevention programs with local communities where we can um, try to work to turn people away from violence. As, as Jill explained earlier, it can be idiosyncratic. They may have personal grievances mixed up with kind of conspiracy theories they've seen online, mixed up with other problems they may be having. And if we can have interventions with those uh, individuals, if they can be flagged to us, then there may be other ways, even apart from the criminal justice system, that uh, they can be turned away from violence. And those are things that, that we work on, that DHS has funding to uh, pursue. It's really more at the local level. It's not something that um, with law enforcement takes the lead on, but it's something that we could try to facilitate um, with uh, local communities and social services and things like that. So I, I just wanted to mention that as another piece of it that I think um, both the last administration and this administration have, have both been focused on. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I see my time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Adderholt. Uh, Mr. Case, you are recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, um, Ms. Sunburn. I, I'll start here. And, and following up a little bit on our prior discussion about coordination, uh, and I'm, I'm, I appreciate that you mentioned uh, state and local partners because that's kind of where I was going next. We, of course, uh, fund uh, uh, many of these programs. We've got, um, you know, uh, state homeland security grants. We've got urban area security initiatives and then uh, burn JAG program. And actually, if we add all of those uh, grant numbers up, it actually exceeds 
it, it exceeds the, the justice's counterterrorism uh, budget. Of course, those are not all directed to domestic terrorism. They're across the spectrum of law enforcement. But my question is, is, is a, a very general one. I just would like you to expand on how those programs are going with your state and local law enforcement partners and, and, and how are they morphing, I guess I would ask you, as, as your own uh, responsibilities uh, ramp up and our, our collective concerns ramp up. Are, they, are those programs, um, you know, uh, do they have enough flexibility in them to adjust to the uh, exigencies of the times? Yes, sir. I think they do. I think those programs are going well. Uh, we uh, benefit greatly from the Department of Homeland Security's fusion centers. Uh, one of the ones that I have personal experience with, um, and I can tell you the partnership, thanks to the partnership with them, has often predicated a lot of cases for us, is one out of Orange County, California. So we benefit greatly from uh, the funding of those fusion centers and the relationship that we, the FBI, have with them. Also, there's lots of instances that I could tell you about where thanks to the work of our state and local partners and say they're on the heels of a search warrant in somebody's home, they notice something that alerts them to potentially a domestic violent extremist ideology might be present there and we benefit from the referrals of those. So teaching them what to look for in that partnership has um, continued to pay off as well. Uh, is, that, is that teaching, is that part of those grant programs? Is, or I mean, you, you, you provide, we provide that money to them to, to, to partner with you, but where do they actually get that where is the actual interaction going on from a, from a teaching perspective, a sensitization, I guess I would say, uh, perspective? Because I, I would assume that, that throughout the country with thousands and thousands of uh, probably agencies out there at the state and local level, that there are, that are, there are some are just very good at recognizing um, um, the signs and reporting back and some that are perhaps a little bit more removed from Washington, D.C. in that way. How do, you, how do you actually get that education across? Yeah, that's a great question. And so anything we do uh, on their behalf is definitely coming out of our funding. Um, so that would be something that we would fund sort of the teaching them the different things that we want them to pay attention to. But it also comes from the day to day interaction with them on the JTTF. And that, again, is uh, something we would fund would be their spot on the Joint Terrorism Task Force. And so they get both formal training from us. Um, they participate in JTTF executive board meetings that happen at minimum quarterly and oftentimes monthly. And then their day-to-day -day presence on the JTTFs is also almost like on the job training as they work hand in hand with us. Okay, so I mean, going back to kind of the middle part of my question, are they? Are they? You, I, I assume you are saying that yes, they are, in their current construct, flexible enough to adjust to what you believe you need from your state and local law enforcement partners right now. I believe so, sir. And um, you know, as I mentioned earlier. That is one area that we would potentially grow, you know, with our increase in potential resources would be to add task force officers, more training, et cetera. Okay. Uh, Mr. Wigman, anything to add in my remaining time? No, sir. Okay. And then I'll just take a little bit more time then and ask you um, kind of the same general question about your ATAC, Anti-Terrorism Advisory Councils with the U.S. Attorneys. Ms. Sanborn um, set up operating well. Um, I think you would agree part of your front lines as well. Yeah, they are on the front lines and they work very close. I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. I got the wrong, uh, wrong person to ask the question of. Go ahead. Yes, they work. I, we think they work pretty well. We're, we're want to make sure that, I mean, historically they focus on international terrorism and domestic terrorism, but we want to be emphasizing like, the threat in picture now, the domestic um, terrorist threat, and they are doing that. They work very closely with the JTTS that, uh, that Jill has already described. Um, so we, we think they're functioning effectively, but we're, we're doubling down just in light of the, um, the current threat environment to increase the training to make sure we're doing everything possible um, with our different U.S. Attorney's offices to make sure they have the tools they need and the people, the personnel, the training to make sure they're on top of this. That's part of your 10% budget increase request also? It would be in the U.S. Attorney's offices. They, they would plus up uh, in that area. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Case. Uh, Mr. Klein, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to circle back to Mr. Wigman's answer to a question. Uh, I was having some technical difficulty from a remote location. Um, 
Mr. Wigman, the mission of the National Security Division is to protect the United States from threats to our national security by pursuing justice through law. And you mentioned uh, your position on proposals to codify uh, a uh, to um, codify a domestic terrorism charge in the criminal code. Can you reiterate your position on that? Whether you think that's necessary, and and uh, what sections of the code are already uh, in use to combat domestic terrorism? Yeah, so, so thanks for that question. Um, that is something that we're thinking about as we, as we are looking at all, the, all of our tools to see if in light of the threat environment, or do we, are we doing everything we can uh, to, to counter the threat? And so one of the things we're looking at is do, would we need new authorities? Um, look, we, we think we've been pretty successful using the authorities that we have already. And just to, to mention the different statutes that we've used in this area, we have you know, weapons charges, uh, charges related to explosives, threat, riot, hoax charges, attacks on federal officials and facilities, hate crimes when that's available, arson. There's a long laundry list of charges. It really depends on the facts of the case that we use. And so the question we're really wrestling with is, are there gaps? Is there some, some type of conduct that we can envision that we can't cover or would there be a benefit, other, otherwise benefit in having something else other than what we're having now? We haven't reached any conclusions on that. It's something that we're thinking about. And if we do come up with something, well, obviously we work with the, this committee and others in Congress towards that. But we haven't we haven't um, identified anything yet that uh, would be a need for legislation. But it is something that we're actively considering. Okay. Thank you. I, I would ask that you uh, keep in touch with members on both sides of the aisle, uh, on this committee and on the Judiciary Committee, if you're uh, working towards that end. Absolutely. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, that was my remaining question. Now I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Klein. Mr. Garcia, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I uh, just wanted to follow up on our, on our previous conversation. We defined uh, domestic terrorism. Uh, we talked about some of the cases uh, or, or some of the uh, situations around the nation in our metropolitan areas as well as uh, January 6th. Um, we, we you ended with uh, Mr. Wigman that, that domestic terrorism itself is not a, an applicable or available charge. Uh, is that's a correct statement, right? I just want to make sure that I, I captured that last statement correctly. That's correct. There is no domestic terrorism offense as such. Uh, with with the federal code, it does provide uh, the enhancements. One of which you, you talked about, which is maximizing the the, the, the statutory. Uh, enhancing the statutory maximums for offenses involving uh, or intended to facilitate domestic or international terrorism. Uh, but it also defines other uh, expanded investigative tools and, and beyond just the sentencing enhancements uh, to include uh, uh, the search warrants, uh, expediting uh, search warrants and investigations, reducing delays, um, allowing judges to grant orders, giving investigators greater access to certain educational and taxpayer records and domestic and international terrorism. Uh, there's a few other things. The statutory maximums probably being the most uh, important piece of that. Uh, I, I guess to follow up on the questions that I had relative to, to, to really any of the events over the last, call it, year and a half, uh, are, are you seeing the application of any of these enhancement tools to either the events on, well, let's start with the events on January 6th. Uh, are the enhancement tools available as defined under this, this domestic terrorism uh, uh, clause being applied at all to uh, folks who were arrested or investigated during January 6th events? So those are ongoing cases. I don't think we've gotten any cases that have gotten to that stage yet in terms of sentencing. Um, so I don't think we'd be in a position yet to. No. But there, but there's tools that are pre-sentencing, right? There, there's the the application of search warrants in, in cases involving domestic terrorism. Um, outside of their districts, judges can now authorize search warrants, um, ex expedited uh, search warrants. Uh, judges may grant orders giving investigate get investigators uh, greater access to certain educational and taxpayer records. Have any of those tools pre-sentencing been, been applied uh, in, for the events of January 6th? It's a good question. I don't know. I don't know the answer. I, I, uh, my expectation would be some of them would. I know that some people, for example, have been held in uh, pretrial detention and that we've mm -hmm. 
have invoked that uh, that provision that is a presumption for pretrial detention in those cases. I don't know if Ms. Samborn has any more specific information about that. I'll ask her. Ms. Samborn? Nothing to add to what Brad. Okay. Uh, have any of these enhancement tools been applied uh, either in the uh, pre-sentencing or sentencing stage, which I'm assuming we are there now for riots in cities like Portland, Seattle, uh, or Minneapolis? So it's a good question, Congressman. I, I just don't know the answer. I, I'll get back to you. Though. I'll see if okay. I, I think it's really important to understand that. I mean, if, we, if we're talking about uh, how, how prolific and expanded domestic violence, uh, domestic terrorism is, and DVE is becoming more prolific. I think it's very important, especially with these agencies, to understand where we, we were, where we are applying uh, these these enhancements uh, as as defined under under the code, as as you've outlined, um, and, and really understand not only where they're being used, but the effectivity of their use. Um, so that we can we can communicate to to our constituents what the government is doing to protect them. Uh, I think that's very important. Um, has anyone in a, and I understand that domestic terrorism itself is not an applicable charge, but but is terrorism uh, being charged in in any of the events around January sixth? Uh, no, there is no terrorism. There is no inter really, there are charges related to international terrorism. Um, those obviously would not be applicable to January 6th, but um, th there is no terrorism charge per se that is being used for the Capitol. Um, uh, there is a federal crime of terrorism, right? There's not, it's not just international terrorism, but the crime is terrorism, correct? No, there's, the, the one that I think of the most is um, uh, 2339B, which is material support to terrorism. That's to a designated foreign terrorist organization, so that's only for international. There's also terrorism that transcends national boundaries. Um, that's an international terrorism uh, charge. So we have some things in the international terrorism area that are closer to what you would call a terrorism offense than, than we just, that we don't have on the, on the domestic. Okay, I'm out of time. I'd love to get your input on whether there should be a discrete charge for domestic terrorism uh, under these statutes, but we can we can defer that for later conversation. I yield back, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Garcia, and you will get that chance in the third round. We're going to go to the third round since there are only four of us uh, remaining. Um, I want to pick up uh, with our witnesses on something Mr. Uh, Case was talking about, coordination uh, among agencies in, in the fight against terrorism of any, of any strike. Data on domestic terrorism um, unlike that of international terrorism, is not maintained uh, in any single repository. It certainly doesn't pop up easily uh, on an inter internet search. Uh, FBI, NSD, ATF, and BJS all keep different data, uh, some only accessible through Freedom of Information Act requests. And there are also multiple private databases such as TRAC, T-R-A-C, at Syracuse, and START at the University of Maryland. This alphabet soup of information uh, may keep researchers employed, but it is not easy to sift through. So, uh, Mr. Wigman, here's the question. Does NSD routinely track prosecutions and convictions related to domestic terrorism and DVEs? And if not, please explain. Yeah, so um, here's the challenge. You're absolutely right. It uh, can be confusing on the, on the data tracking, at least on the prosecution side. And the reason for that is uh, there are a few reasons for that. Um, until very recently, the department's process for tracking these cases was totally decentralized. In other words, you could have U.S. Attorney's Office around the country bringing cases, as I mentioned earlier. It's, there is not a domestic terrorism charge, so it could just be a weapons charge. It could be a threat charge. It could be arson. You, you don't know what the charge might be. And there wasn't a centralized mechanism for uh, overseeing all of those cases. Also, within Maine Justice, you have the Civil Rights Division, you have even a tax division because some uh, terrorists refuse to pay taxes, anti-government people. Um, you have the National Security Division. So even within Maine Justice, you have different divisions. So 
recently we've taken steps to address that situation because that made data, data collection for DOJ on prosecution very challenging in a way that it wasn't on the international side. So we just recently issued guidance, and I talk about this a little bit in my written testimony to the field, which is creating a new mechanism whereby they're going to have to report to the National Security Division, to the counterterrorism section, any case that is designated as DVE-related. It creates standards for, for setting a, a case as DVE-related, and so we're going to have a more centralized mechanism that will help us track data going forward. That's a new change. It just was instituted last month, but we're taking steps in that direction. I would think that's particularly important, and uh, please pass it up the chain. If, if more resources are needed to get that done, we want to know about it. Um, and by the way, uh, to both of our witnesses, you've received requests from uh, members of our subcommittee, I think notably Mr. Klein and Mr. Garcia, for more information, and I would uh, consider it uh, uh, the right thing to do uh, on behalf of the entire subcommittee. Please uh, cooperate with them and give them what they need. Now, uh, Ms. Sanborn, I, I want to note the fiscal year 21 appropriation requires the FBI to report not later than 100 day, 180 days after enactment of the act on, quote, the number of incidents in fiscal years 2016 through 2020 that required surveillance, investigation, and prosecution of white supremacist activity or racially motivated violent extremism associated with white supremacist ideology and include, if available, incidents in which the FBI deferred to state or local authorities, unquote. Is the Bureau on track to provide that report? Sir, I'm not tracking the specific report that you're referencing, so I'll look into that, but I am aware of the report that we're in the process of publishing under the NDAA, which I think will feed into exactly what you uh, started your questioning with, which is sort of a holistic view of the domestic violent extremist threat. Okay, good. Let's follow up on that. Uh, and to the extent statistics on DVE incidents could be shared in more transparent if sanitized or aggregate form to Congress and the public, is that something that the FBI would support, Ms. Sandberg? So yes, I think that's exactly what the um, product under the NDAA will provide. Uh, historically, I think that has been classified and what the NDAA report that's in the works and it's getting coordinated on now is at the unclassified level so that it is shareable with you all and uh, the communities. Thank you. Uh, I, I yield to our ranking member, Mr. Adderall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, in uh, his testimony before the uh, United States Senate, uh, Director Ray depicted uh, the group that uh, came into the uh, uh, Jan Capitol January the 6th, the protesters, uh, as an inverted pyramid with uh, peaceful protesters compromising the largest numbers of those that were involved. Uh, the next level were people who attended the protest and were swept up in the momentum of the day, mostly engaging in low-level trespassing. And finally, the third group was the most uh, threatening, and those were the, those that breached the grounds of the Capitol and engaged in acts of actual violence. Uh, and I would ask this question to either one uh, of you. Among those who protested at the Capitol on January the 6th, how many or what percentage do you estimate were actual domestic violent extremists? So, so we wouldn't necessarily have any uh, collection on just those individuals who were exercising their First Amendment right to protest. Uh, really, what we focused on in that inverted pyramid is was described by the director is that smaller bucket that showed up intent on uh, conducting harm. And those would be the individuals who assaulted federal officers, breached the building, and got inside. And um, of those cases, there definitely are some of those individuals that we look at as domestic violent extremists. Can't comment on any specific particulars because those are still ongoing. But that smaller tip of the pyramid, again, is what we focused on. And some of those individuals um, definitely fall in the domestic violent extremist category. And would you distinguish those from uh, perhaps what the director said was low-level trespassing? Yes, sir. We do just have some uh, cases on individuals who um, made it into the Capitol that maybe potentially weren't involved in the actual breach and or the assault on federal officers 
and uh, the evidence we presented uh, to the United States Attorney likely would just result in trespassing charges. As far as the people that has actually been charged in connection with the uh, January the 6th, uh, uh, with uh, the, uh, the militant and domestic terrorism networks, uh, what would be your guess? Of, or what, do you know how many people have actually been charged? There's over 430 people who've been charged total, and that number keeps changing, so that'll keep going up. If that was your question. Yes, sir. Yes, thank you. Uh, do you believe that uh, the prolonged security measures that we currently have at the U.S. Capitol have been appropriate uh, to prevent uh, domestic terror threats? I, I'll start, and Brad, you can comment. I don't have any specifics on, you know, the actual mechanisms in place. I would just say to you one phenomena that we've at least seen in the international terrorism side is we do know that our adversaries in the terrorism space pay attention to hardened and soft targets. And so having the appearance of uh, it being a hardened tar target is always a potential deterrent. So we have at least seen them pay attention to that and comment on soft versus hard targets. And so I would imagine that that's true for all of our adversaries. I would just defer to the security experts on that. Oh, and then lastly, uh, what are some uh, examples or incidences of where the FBI have identified acts of Antifa violence or people subscribing to Antifa in recent months or years? And how successful has the Justice Department been in prosecuting members of the, the Antifa extremist violent groups? Yeah, I'll start with just highlighting that, you know, Antifa definitely is a real thing, and it actually uh, falls into our anti-government, anti-authority overarching bucket, and specifically um, anarchist violent extremists. We definitely have cases on individuals who self-identify with Antifa. Um, thinking back on my last year as the AD of CTD, I can only think of one uh, individual in particular who would have self-identified with Antifa who then went on to conduct a violent act, and that would be uh, the individual in Portland, Mr. Reinhall, when he shot Aaron Danielson. Mr. Wigman, anything to add? Yeah, uh, there have been cases that we brought against, in, as, as uh, Ms. Zambor mentioned, in the category of um, anarchists. Um, extremist, um, which is what Antifa falls into that bucket, whether we have any individual case where the person self-identified as Antifa, I'm not sure. We do have some cases against anarchists. We have the case that Ms. Sanborn mentioned where uh, the individual was, was killed before um, he was able to be apprehended, where that person, I think, did self-identify as, uh, as Antifa. And then obviously, the absence of an indication on the charging document whether someone self-identifies with Antifa is not necessarily an indication that there aren't any cases because that's true in a lot of our cases. You don't necessarily have a specific group or ideology that someone's identified with. You think that they've been associated with uh, a riot or other behavior, but you just may not have that based on the charges or it may not be necessary for the case. So it's, I'm sorry if it's a little bit complicated to your question, but we're not necessarily going to know because we don't, the people may not always announce themselves as to what uh, group they're affiliated with and so forth. But we do have a number of ca cases that are that we would put in the anti and the anarchist bucket that is the same uh, bucket that uh, Antifa and uh, people associated with the Antifa movement would, be, would fall into. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Adenholt. Uh, Mr. Case, you are recognized for five minutes. Uh, th <clears throat> thank you. And, and before I ask my question, I just want to say that I, I personally appreciate your testimony and your service. I think it's a very hard time to get this right. And I appreciate your realistic assessment of where we are and what we need to do. Um, let me let me talk a little bit about our military, because um, uh, one of the unfortunate uh, and tragic, in many cases, realities we've had to face is is extremism within our armed services. Um, and um, the FBI, of course, has, has, has um, reviewed this and reported to our uh, 
Armed Services uh, Committees uh, on, on the subject about uh, last June, I think it was. Um, and I'm, I'm interested in following up on that and understanding um, the broader picture of what um, <clears throat> What coordinated activities are taking? Well, I guess I would ask you two questions. Is the is the primary perceived threat um, more a matter of individual action by folks um, enlisting um, um, or, or gaining entry to our military uh, who are predisposed perhaps to to violence, um, as we've seen in some cases, or is it or is there a, is there a realistic threat of kind of a more organized? Um, attempt to uh, get into our our military from a, from a terrorism perspective that that would you know give rise to a um, a broader set of concerns and and what is the coordination going on I suppose uh, with uh, between the FBI or justice overall and our military how how is that issue being addressed right now what is its status and where is it going. Yeah, thank you for the question, and I understand the importance of it, obviously, because those are individuals that are in uh, positions of trust. And we, while we certainly have domestic violent extremist cases on individuals that are associated with the military and law enforcement, that number is actually relatively small, and it is primarily on individuals that are formers, not currents. And so that's one thing I would note. I would also note that we don't necessarily uh, see sort of a concerted organized effort. Um, and we also don't necessarily know whether an individual, uh, say, seeks out military or law enforcement because of an ideology or whether they're in the military and law enforcement and some sort of uh, violent extremist ideology comes later. Um, but like I said, we have seen some instances of that. It's fairly small. Uh, what I can tell you uh, that is a very positive is we have a great relationship with the US military they actually sit on the National Joint Terrorism Task Force. The most um, sits out there at Liberty Crossings with us. And so we often get um, not only referrals from them, but work those, closes, uh, those cases closely. Um, and actually, they take this very seriously and I think had a, a stand down day where we actually then did an employee all hands for them and we talked to their workforce about violent extremism. What about the basics of just um, ad advanced um, advanced joining the military, for that matter, after people are in the military, you know, data collection to identify potential uh, risks, just as you're doing, just as you're doing in the, in the general population using the, you know, the early warning systems that you have in place uh, through state and local partners. Um, is that is that coordinated with the military so that they have the information they need to make basic decisions about whether to to um, you know enlist or otherwise uh, admit people to to the to the armed services. Yes, sir. I think um, the process that I highlighted for you, for you of the relationship once the individuals in the military is very mature and robust. Um, I think you definitely have highlighted something that we are working on, which is a closer relationship with them in sort of the application process, because if somebody ends up washing out for some reason, um, how do we potentially have a relationship with them where that could be a potential referral to us? And so that is something um, months ago we started working on them with and uh, something we hope to keep continuing and perfecting. Do they routinely consult with you on on, on enlistments uh, from, from the perspective of, you know, cross coordinating between their information sources and, and your and your information sources? No, sir, not that I'm aware of. Like I said, we both have had conversations with, you know, how to have a process and improve on that process. Again, not mature yet, but at this point, um, that is one area I think we can continue to work closer with them on and try to make it as effective as the process of the individual that's already in service. Okay, Mr. Wigman, anything to add? Sir. Okay, thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Case. And uh, Mr. Garcia, we recognize you for the last five minutes of questions. Make them good ones. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll do my best. Uh, Ms. Sanborn, you, you mentioned something uh, a few minutes ago where you said, uh, I think I, I've got it written down, uh, that there's only been one member who has self-identified as Antifa that went on to commit violent acts that you're aware of. I think you cited, I think it was Mr. Uh, Michael Reinel who killed uh, Aaron Danielson is, is the example of that. Is, is what I just 
stated what you meant to say. Uh, only really only one person who has self-identified as Antifa went on to commit violent acts. Yes, Sarah, thank you for the question because it does afford some clarification. So of our predicated subjects, so of people that are on our radar screen, um, in my last one year as the assistant director, I cannot think, it doesn't mean that there's not one there I can't remember, but I can only think of one subject um, that self-identified with Antifa, so part of our anarchist violent extremist uh, cases that went on to conduct a violent act, and that would be Mr. Reinhold. So it's very possible that other self-identifying Antifa individuals might have done something that just are not an FBI predicated case or not on our radar. Okay, uh, thank you for that clarification. I, I would submit there's been uh, dozens, if not hundreds, of self-identified Antifa members who have maybe not killed someone or committed murder, but but have been looting, uh, violently confronting law enforcement uh, around our nation in various cities, have started fires, uh, torn down businesses, et cetera. So I, I just want to make sure that we're not, uh, uh, while we're while we're putting a spotlight on on what you all have called the far right uh, domestic violence, so that we're not also uh, forgetting uh, those from the far left and and frankly everyone in between. This is a problem that's full spectrum and deserves uh, to be treated as such. Thank you for that clarification, uh, Mr. Uh, Weigman. Uh, Weigman, I apologize. Uh, I want to go back to the the last question uh, that I, my fadeaway shot from the last round there, if you will. Uh, do you think that that having a discrete charge uh, for domestic terrorism is warranted? Uh, and, and if so, why? If not, why not? As I mentioned in uh, response to one of the other questions, that's that's something that we're actively considering. Um, we, we, the overall, our overall position is we think we've been pretty successful with, with the authorities we have already. We have a lot of criminal statutes in our in our toolkit that we've talked about today that we use. We've been pretty successful. We haven't identified a lot of cases where we can't uh, charge someone based on a lack of authority, but we're looking at it to see whether we think an uh, additional charge would be useful. And if we, if we come up with something, then we would obviously uh, work with the Congress on, on that proposal. Okay. And I, I am keenly interested, as, as uh, Chairman Cartwright mentioned, I do want to see the data behind the enhancement tools, whether they've been applied, the success of those uh, applications and pre-sentencing and also uh, in, in during the sentencing phase, I, I think, uh, you know, these, these words matter, the statutes matter, the enhancements matter, and, and having that close feedback, feedback loop on the effects of these enhancements and these tools that are, that are being made available is very important, and it's not just being used to, as, as a political tool or to weaponize uh, something against a, a, a certain demographic. So really interested, th th just to be clear, the ask is, uh, if we can, especially call, you know, let's let's bound it uh, with with an 18 month uh, scope here, uh, places where these enhancement tools, uh, not the charges, but just the tools that come with uh, the with the enhanced uh, uh, capabilities have been applied in any of the riots uh, throughout our nation, but also in addition to the events on January 6th, um, and 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 obviously if there is any. Uh, charges that have gotten through the sentencing phase, if there's been any application of the enhanced uh, uh, statutory maximums being applied to those uh, those charges as a result of having a flavor of domestic terrorism, uh, that, that that's that specifically is the information. I'm not asking you to boil the ocean or uh, or give us every charge uh, that's currently being uh, you know looked at that may have this uh, the, these enhancements, but just the the riots within our cities um, related to uh, the various movements as well as January 6th, if that makes sense. We'll see if we can, what, uh, what kind of information we can generate for you, sir. Thank you, sir. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Garcia. And to our witnesses, Executive Assistant Director Sanborn and Deputy Assistant Attorney General Wigman, uh, thank you for uh, appearing today uh, for questioning. Uh, it is a a particular pleasure for members of Congress to be able to interrogate FBI agents and federal prosecutors. Um, but uh, we appreciate your answers. Uh, I appreciate your willingness to further engage with our members to satisfy their concerns. Uh, and with that, uh, this hearing is hereby adjourned. <laughs>